one of the many difficult things that we've we've had to go through over the past year it's been a year now pretty much uh, with everything that's going on there have been many things we've had to struggle with and many things with we've had to adjust um, our worship how we do things right and uh, we've all been a part of that and one of the things is the Lord's Supper and I want to urge you all um, to please do your best to stay focused when we're partaking of the Lord's Supper because it's real easy now we got this cup right here and we just boom get it over with let's get it over with and let's go on to the next thing and so let's please all of us, and I'm talking to me too, because it's real easy just to kind of, well, let's get it done, right? And let's get it over with, and let's go to the next thing, and let's get that done so we can get out of here, right? And do that. All right, we're here to worship and to honor God and remember that great sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And so um, let's, let's do our best to try to stay focused. Um, it's, it's hard. It, it's hard. Right? We're, we're, as you know, I mean, I don't have to tell you that. So let's, um, let's do our best to try to stay focused in our singing and in our, in our study and our prayers and all these things um, to remember, remember Jesus and God. So I want to talk to you this morning for just a, a few minutes about... Um, just real fundamental, okay, basic things that we need to, to keep in mind, okay, as we go about. Um, and so, I want to ask you some questions. What do you, what do you think of when you hear the word church? Right? What do you think of when you hear the word church? You know, people out, there are many people out in the world that are confused, right, about, the, about what the, uh, the Bible's concept of church is. Um, do you think the church is important? Okay, well, someone says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you better be careful. There's some people that don't. Don't think the church is important. Someone may ask the question, are we still waiting for the church to be established? That's, that's something to think about. Well, if it has been established, where did it begin at? And how do we know that, 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 that the church is, is here, right? That it did begin. Was the church an afterthought with God? You ever heard this? There are some people say that, well, you know, um, Jesus came down to establish his kingdom, but the people rejected him. And since they rejected him, then he just set up the church, and, kinda, and he's going to go back, and he's going to come back later and then establish his kingdom, set up his kingdom. Now, some people teach that. Is that true? Was the church an afterthought with God? Well, what is the church supposed to be like? You know, what is the, uh, the makeup of, of the church and, you know, and all the things? How is it supposed to be? You know, are we supposed to be a militant group, right? Ready to, you know, go out and... What's the church supposed to be like? Can we do without the church? Someone says, well, you know... We can do without it. Can we just preach Jesus and leave the church out of it? And I meant to go back and change a couple of words on that. I should have said, should we just preach Jesus and leave the church out of it? Right? The word can, you can, right? You can do it. <laughs> the question is, should we just preach Jesus and leave the church out of it? So, what about some of these things? What about the church? What do you think of? Well, first of all, let's talk about, just for a, a couple of minutes, the, the word church itself. Okay, and, we've, and I'm sure if you've been around, you know, you've heard this word before, but it comes from a Greek word. Okay, the Greek word is ekklesia. The word is translated for church. 
ecclesia. And the word ecclesia, all it means is a called out body. And it can refer to a religious group or it can just refer to a group of people, you know, that have, that have come. It can be just, it's a collective word, it's a collective noun. Okay, and so it's talking about a called out body. Now, the way it's used in the Bible, okay, which is what we're concerned about, right? The, one, the way we want to talk about it is the word can be used in two different senses, Okay, and, we, and you've heard this before. The word church is sometimes used in a universal sense. And what that means is that it's talking about the called out, those that are called out of the world into God's service. Okay, a called out body of people into God's service. That's talking about all of God's people, of all time, of all pla- in all places. So that's why we would say it's a universal sense that the word is used, right? But it's also used in the Bible in what we would consider a local sense, meaning a group of called out people in a certain location. Um, the group of Christians or the group of people in Philippi, right? The Christians in, or the brethren in Philippi, the, the brethren in Thessalonica, okay, from when, he's, when Paul is writing to the Thessalonians. That's a group of people, a group of Christians in a certain location, Okay, that is a church, okay, used in the local sense. So, but the church universal is, right, everybody, right? All of the Christians of all time, of all places, right? And so, that's how the word church is used. So, when you see the word church, the first question is, what is the church, right? You, you, we, we've got to say that the, tr- the, the church is not that building, okay? It's not this building, but it is the collective group of called out people. People. Okay, when you hear the word church, you really need to think the real concept is people that we're talking about. Okay, and it's the people that are called out of the world into God's service. Okay, into God's kingdom, if you will, or whatever. And so that's when you first think about the word church, that's what you need to think about. So, one of the other things that we're going we're gonna to talk about, it, and so we're not going to maybe answer all of these today, but I wanted you to think about some things. So, here's one of the things. Was the church an afterthought with God? We're still waiting for the church to be established. Is it important? Is it something that just God just kind of, you know, He wanted to set up His kingdom and didn't work out well, and let's just throw the church in there, right? Let's get that, you know, at least get that going, and then He'll come back later and set up His kingdom. What is, is the church an afterthought with God? Well, the reading this morning that Jace led us in, okay, should have answered that question for us. And we're not going to look at all of that again, but I've got it right here, a couple of the verses. Verses 10 and 11 of Ephesians chapter 3. That through the church, now listen, there's our word, there's our word. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Okay, so sounds like this was God's wisdom, first of all. Okay, His wisdom is made known through the church, the wisdom of God. Now, let's keep reading, verse 11. This was according to the eternal purpose. Kind of sounds like that it was not an afterthought with God. It was His eternal purpose. Okay, all of this was his eternal purpose, which he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. The eternal purpose, the manifold wisdom God made known through the church, it is through his eternal purpose he realized through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it sounds like the church was part of the plan from the beginning. Okay, God's eternal purpose, the church. So, must be important to God, part of His eternal plan, okay? And remember, we've talked about in lessons past, someone says, well, well, Jesus came to the earth, He was going to set up His kingdom, and yet people rejected Him, and so He wasn't able to do it, so He just set up His church. Okay, you're not going to thwart God's plan, (laughs) okay? It doesn't matter what nation it is and what people are going to do. You're not going to mess with God's plan. This was God's plan. This is the way God intended for it to be, Okay? All the way from the beginning. And the church, the church is just simply 
the vehicle that he used, this part of God's wisdom, he used to, to save people, okay? The saved are in the church, okay? And we're going to get more into that as we go. Okay, so I want to spend the rest of our time this morning in one passage in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. <clears throat> this, you answer a lot of questions from this one, four verses. From this four verses, it's amazing what you can find out about the church. Okay, what you can find out about the church from Isaiah chapter 2. Now, you, I, we could have also turned this morning to Joel chapter 2. We could have turned to Micah chapter 4. All of these are different prophets that talked about, that prophesied about the coming church or the coming kingdom, if you will. Okay, we're not going to spend all the time on those this morning because they're pretty much some of them saying the exact same words. Okay, We're going to look at Isaiah's account. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 1. The word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Okay, so let's answer some questions then from this passage about establishing the church, or, the, or as this says, the Lord's house, the house of the Lord. Number one is, the question is, what is going to be established? What is going to be established? Verse 2 answers that for us. Listen to what he says. It shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established. The mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established. Someone says, well, what is that? All right, what is, the, what is the, the house of the Lord? I thought we were talking about the church. You know, you're talking about his house. Okay, well, what is it? Well, we can go one passage in the New Testament that's going to answer that for us. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 says this. Paul writing to Timothy, If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. Or, as some translators say, in the house of the Lord, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So this passage tells us that the house of the Lord and the church are the same thing. Okay? The house of the Lord and the church are the same thing. What's going to be established? The house of the Lord, the church of the living God. Now... You can also look in Matthew chapter 16 and see that Jesus talks about building His church. Listen to what He says, Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And you say, well, why do why you bring up that verse? Well, first of all, I want to show you that, first of all, Jesus said he was going to build his church. When he was upon the earth, he said, I'm going to build my church. But he also tells Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. The kingdom and the church are referring to one another. Okay? He's not going to build something and then give Peter the keys to something else. <laughs> okay? He's going to build his church. He's going to give him the keys. In order, the keys mean he's just going to give him access to give to get inside of it. Okay? And that's what he did in Acts chapter 2. That was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. But I want you to see, brethren, that the church 
of the living God is the house of the Lord that was going to be established. Isaiah prophesied, listen to me, 700 years before Jesus was on the earth. He told the people exactly what God was going to do 700 years before it happened. What's going to be established? The house of the Lord. Number two, who will establish it? Who's going to establish it? Well, verse 2 again, okay? Here's a kind of fascinating that The mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established by the highest, uh, as the highest of the mountains. The Lord. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. The Lord is going to establish this. Now, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 40. We've already talked about Matthew 16, 18. I'm kind of getting ahead. Matthew 16, 18. Okay, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. Okay, and he said, Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So God said, God, Jesus was God, Jesus is God. So God, the Lord, is going to build his church. Now in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, another important passage. And what I did, I tried to put some, some passages here. These are ones that we're hitting on right now. Very important passage to help us understand Isaiah chapter 2. Okay, Daniel 2.44. In Daniel 2.44, you remember the great statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw? And remember the head was made of gold and the chest of silver and all the things, you know. And, the, and it, what it was, those were different kingdoms. And what God did was God told the people, if you will listen to this prophecy, you're going to know exactly when the kingdom's going to come. And in Daniel 2, 44 is a very important verse. He says, in the days of these kings, these kings, the ones that he's talking about, the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw. He says, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven is going to establish a kingdom that will never be destroyed. That kingdom is the kingdom that Jesus said he was going to build his church on and give Peter the keys to. Okay? So this is what we're talking about. Who's going to establish it? The Lord is going to establish it. There's not a man that has ever established the church. Now there's a lot of, I guess we call them denominations or churches out there that were started by men. But Jesus said, I will build my church, His church, Jesus built that, not any man. And in fact, in Matthew 15 and verse 13, Jesus said, every plant that my Father has not planted will be rooted up. Something to think about. Okay, next question we're going to answer. We've got what is going to be established, the house of the Lord. Who will establish it? The Lord is going to establish it. When will it be established? When will it be established? Well, notice that it says there back in verse 2 again, and I highlighted this. Now, this translation, the Revised Standard Version, it says, in the latter days. Okay? Uh, most translations, other translations, are going to say, in the last days. Okay? In the last days, or in the latter days. That's when it's going to be established. Now, we go to the New Testament. Remember, we've already talked about Daniel. Remember, Daniel said there's going to be kings, kingdoms, nations going to rise, right? And they're going to fall. And in the days of these kings, God's going to set up his kingdom. So he's already given a, a general time frame, okay? When Jesus was upon the earth, he even said, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to do it, okay? And so notice now, Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. Jesus, this is Jesus speaking, listen. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with power. So remember one of our first questions at the very beginning? We said, well, some, you know, some said, well, maybe God didn't set up his kingdom. Remember, he, remember he, is it an afterthought about the church, right? Maybe he couldn't set up his kingdom and he, he set up his church and he said, I'll come back later. And said, no, Jesus said... There's some of you standing here that he was talking to. You're not going to taste death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. 
It was going to come during their lifetime. Okay, that's the point you get from that verse. That tells you when this is. In the last days. Well, what does in the last days mean? Or in the latter times? Uh, Hebrews chapter 1. The Hebrew writer, listen to what he says here. Hebrews 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. Verse 1. At many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. In the last days, in these last days, He has spoken to us, the finality of it, He's spoken to us through His Son. The New Testament age, if you will, we would call that. Right? The time when Jesus came. Those were in the last days, okay? In the last days. You go now to Acts chapter uh, 2. Acts chapter 2. Someone says, when will it be established? In the latter days, it says, the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the highest of the mountains. Acts chapter 2 is when this takes place. This is when it's fulfilled. <clears throat> and we're not going to read all of that, but if you go to Acts chapter 2... Verses 1 through 17, but we're going to just look at verse 16 and 17. Okay? Uh, first of all, verse 15. They, they accused Peter because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were speaking in tongues. They accused him of being drunk. Okay? Something's wrong with these people, right? He says, these people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only 9 in the morning. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. Third hour of the day, I think some, people, some attorneys later say, 9 o'clock in the morning. That's very important. Some of us know when the church was established. We know exactly when it was established. We got the time, okay? Nine o'clock in the morning, listen to what he says. Now, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my service, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And he goes on to speak. He says, this is what's being accomplished right here in your hearing. Okay, so when was the church established? It says in the last days, in the latter days. It was when the New Testament age, and, and if you want to be specific, it was established on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. And depending on how you do the time, it was around A.D. 33 at 9 o'clock in the morning. Not 18 or 1900 or 2000 years later, or, or someone says, well, maybe it's not been established yet. Yes, it has been, according to the Bible. Now, the next question is that we learn from this is where will it be established? Where will it be established? Well, guess what? Isaiah told us 700 years before it happened where it was going to be established at. Look, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He tells them exactly where it is from Jerusalem. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Another very important passage here that gives us insight to help us understand the Scriptures. Luke 24, verse 46, beginning. This is after Jesus has been raised from the dead. He appears to His disciples. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the third day Strive from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city. What city is He talking about? Stay in Jerusalem until you have been clothed with power from on high. What is He talking about? Clothed with power from on high. That was the Holy Spirit coming out of on Acts chapter 2. That's exactly what happens. Okay, look at verse uh, 52, same passage. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And then you go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 tells us the exact same thing. Listen. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will bear my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
Okay. The Lord's church was not established in England, Holland, Bethany, whatever you want to call it. No, it was in Jerusalem. Okay, so let's keep going. There's more questions that are answered. How important will it be? How important will the church be? Isaiah answers that for us. Real simple. Listen to what it says. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. It's going to be established as the highest of the mountains. Some translations say the chief of the mountains. Remember now, what is the church? It's the kingdom of God, right? Remember Daniel 2.44? Remember we talked about that. Daniel 2.44 is an important passage. Many things. But the point is, it's going to be the chief of the mountain. It's going to be preeminent over any religion of man. From idolatry to denominations, God is its maker and provider. It's going to be preeminent over the law of Moses. Because it contains a better covenant found upon better promises. Hebrews 8 and verse 6. It's going to be a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Daniel 2 and verse 44. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. We are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Brethren, don't you want to be a part of a kingdom that cannot be destroyed? Let me tell you something. The United States of America can be destroyed. Okay? The kingdom, the church that we're a part of cannot be destroyed. Seems like to me it's a little more important. <laughs> okay? It's going to be established as the chief of the mountains. The mountains would be considered all the other nations. Okay? It's going to be the highest of the mountains. Okay, so let's, next question. Who is this house for? It says, man, man, this is great, isn't it? Man, this is, this is we're going to establish the, the mountain of the house of the Lord. Right? Who is it for? Jesus was a Jew. Maybe it's just for the Jews. Well, Isaiah tells us. It's going to be established the highest of the mountains that shall be raised above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. What a wonderful passage for us Gentiles. All the nations shall flow to it. It's for everyone. You can turn to Acts chapter 10, 34 and 35. Peter had a problem at first, right? He, could, he had a hard time because he was a Jew. He had been, right, the old law was for the Jews and things. And he had to understand that God does not show partiality. That everybody's going to be saved the same way. It's through faith in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, male or female, whatever it is. We're all saved through Jesus. Romans chapter 1 Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Wonderful passage for us. Most of us know. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also for the Gentile. It's for everyone. There's only two people. Are you either Jew or Gentile, okay? That's it. It's for everyone. And the conditions of salvation are the same for all men. So the next question. What law governs God's house? Right? If you're, you're just like in any kind of uh, kingdom or nation or whatever, you've got laws, right? We have laws in this country. We have laws in our nation, right? And, we, and there's things that we are to abide by. What kind of laws govern God's house? Well, Isaiah tells us. To the house of the God of Jacob, that the, he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of thine shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. It's his law. We don't make up our own laws, right? We don't make up our own things. It's his law. We're to follow his way, his path, his law. And the last question that we're going to answer this morning is this. What will his kingdom be like? That was one of the things we talked about at the very beginning. When you think of the church, what is it going to be like? Are we to be a militant group, right? Are we are we to be a passive group? What are we supposed to be? Well, Isaiah tells us that too. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, 
neither shall they learn war anymore. What is he saying? Swords and the plowshares. If you remember, whereas the nation of Israel had been used to war, they had to go and take the land of Canaan. They had to go and fight for that, right? And they did the opposite. So they turned their plowshares right into swords, right? They did the, they did the opposite, but he says this kingdom's going to be different. Okay? This is going to be a house of peace. God's new kingdom was going to be a spiritual kingdom. In fact, you remember a very important passage, John 18, 36, what Jesus told Pilate. Right? Pilate said, you're a king. He said, yes, but my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus said, if my kingdom were of this world, I'd have my people fighting for it. We'd be out here fighting. You wouldn't have been able to take him. You wouldn't have been able to take me is what Jesus said. But my kingdom is not of this world. It is a house of peace and it is a spiritual kingdom. You can turn to, to Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 20, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. Talks about the fact that the weapons that we fight are not the weapons of this world. We got a spiritual war going on, right? Okay, and we're using the spiritual armor that God has given us. Our salvation, our faith, the word of the Lord, the sword of the spirit, all these things. Okay, these are things to help us fight against the devil. Spiritual armor. So brethren, here we go. How, how good you do? Did you answer all those questions? Everybody had it? We had it, right? We were good. What's going to be established? All this we can learn from Isaiah 2. What's going to be established? The house of the Lord. Who will establish it? The Lord's going to establish it. When will it be established? In the last days. Remember we talked about it and we saw the passages. When that's talking about the New Testament age. The day of Pentecost to be exact. Acts chapter 2. Where will it be established? At Jerusalem. That's where, when you say established, what does that mean? That's where it was started. That's where it began. Okay? How important will it be? It's going to be the chief of the mountains. It's going to be the most important thing there is. Okay? Who is this house forth for all nations? Remember, it's just a called out body of people is what the church means. That's what that word means. It's talking about people. It's all the people who have been called out of the world into God's service. All nations. What law governs God's house? His laws. And what will His kingdom be like? Spiritual and peaceful. There it is, brethren. So, brethren, the church was part of God's eternal plan. It's important to God. It's important to Jesus because he died for it. And so, brethren, in turn, it should be important to us. It should be important to us. Because, brethren, only the saved people are in the church. The Lord adds you to the church, those that are being saved, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Jesus died to save people, okay? So don't get, don't get all hung up and say, oh, no. Well, he died to save people, everyone. But brethren, the saved people are those that he puts in the church. So the church is important. And like I said, the church is just talking about all the people of, all the saved people of all time. Why not obey the Lord this morning and be added to his church? I thank you for your attention this morning. The church is important, very important to God. The household of God is the church of the living God. We're about to sing the song, There's a Great Day.